So I want to just kind of give you an overview. What she's trying to give you is an overview of the candidate program. Um, there we go. So some of this I already covered. It's a national program. Um, what can it's like? So it's only for program. produce. It is only for produce. Yeah, and it's only for. Um, it covers production, packing, and now storage, distribution, and repacking. So it doesn't cover processing or any fresh cut. Testing, testing. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. I feel like I can be on a Canadian island. <laughs> <laughs> so if I break the song, I apologize. Good. Okay. All right. So, um, but yes, only relates to produce. And also, there's some commodities that are not within scope. I think she had them here. So she see, uh, you've got production packing and storage, and then this year we're adding wholesaling and repacking. So before the wholesalers and the repackers were not could not be included in the Canada Gap program, and now they are. What is fresh cut? It's not uh, so like mini carrots, uh, sliced apple, like apple it's slices. Processed, not yeah, not yeah. Mixing, so correct. I think some kinds of salad makes this fall under fresh cut. Yeah, like bag salads. Like bag salads. Yeah, or like the coleslaw and stuff. Right. Anything that's, that says the ready to eat on the package, so it's the coleslaw mix. So it's taking the, taking the fresh produce and then doing at least another couple steps to it. Shredding, dicing, anything like that. And they're covered under something else? Yes, there would be covered. Uh, yes. Yeah. What, what's that covered under? Uh, HACCP and uh, FCEP maybe? Like the federal um, HACCP program? You could also, there's also private standards that could cover that as well, something like um, like BRC or SQF. They are private standards that would cover processing or fresh cut. How about nuts? Nuts, um, we don't cover nuts. I kind of think you would, I, um, I'm assuming SQF and BRC would cover nuts. Like a, those private standards would. Um, if you need more information on that, I can give you, you can contact me later and get you information. Because we do offer those services in our office, it's just not through agriculture. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me a lot for the cover of trade and eat, it should be the same trade and eat. What, nuts or? It doesn't matter what the food is. Well, the Canada Gap program doesn't cover it because they did not assess, first of all, it's developed by the produce industry and they didn't assess the specific hazards for those products. So there are different handling practices. Nuts have like will need to be pasteurized. Well, if you're selling them or cooked or heated, there's specific issues. Same with fresh cut, there's additional food safety hazards that are not associated with fresh fruits and vegetables. So that when they developed this program, um, they, they didn't look at those hazards. So there's no practices in place, in place to, to cover it. The basics are there, yes, but you can't get Canada Gap certified um, for, for nuts or fresh cut. You can get food safety certified under any whole bunch of different standards for those products, just not Canada Gap. Would, would, would you assume that the, the actual production of the input of that processing is still covered under Canada Gap? So it would in fact you get two certifications for the same product? Yes, yeah, so if you were, say, um, growing your apples and then slicing them and dicing them and selling them as a sliced product, you could have um, Two, you could have two different certifications, so one for just the growing and harvesting and one for the slicing and dicing. I do believe um, standards like SQF have cover everything, so if you're going to, if you're processing, you might go straight to do the whole thing under a program like SQF or BRC or something like that. Those programs are a little bit more intense than Canada Gap, and I kind of just give you a brief overview, but Canada Gap is, um, kind of an out-of-the-box program. It, all the procedures are written out for you and created for you. So basically, you just tick off the procedures that apply to you. You don't have to create your own written procedures. You don't have to make stuff up on your own. Whereas SQF and BRC, it's much more general. So you have to write up your own written procedures and how you do things, create your own hazard plan, assess your own risks, because once you get into those kinds of operations, what people are doing, what, there's lots of different ways to do things. So it's not it's much more difficult to do a one size fits all kind of program. So so that's sort of the, the background.
Other than that, kind of the basic process is the same. You would get a licensed certification body to, once you developed your program, you would get a licensed certification body to come out and assess your program. Okay. Other questions? So, I just want to clarify, it's just really sure. important for whether yeah. I'm here or not. But if we do fresh cut salads, but they're not, there's no claim that they're ready to eat, even though okay. they're triple wash, then it would fall under this because they're not no, ready. No, we don't cover any bagged salads. Right, but in bulk, like to Okay, us. oh, okay. Yeah, then I think it would be fine. Because you just, it's just like the lettuce mix that you would, you would hardly see back to retail, which I'm assuming would be one of these other ones. Yeah. BRC or SPF, but the bulk stuff that we potentially might be doing with sick kids okay. would go under. Yeah, yeah, like the harvesting, the packing, the washing, we're not going for all of that, yeah. Okay. Does it cover even washing of salmon? We cover washing of produce, product. So, for example, apples. Apples are covered, whole apples are covered from the field or the orchard, I guess you could say. Uh, harvest, you wash them, they pack them into bags, and they ship them up and sell them. That whole process is covered. It's just that if you were to take the apple and cut it up into apple slices and then pack it, and then you'd probably have to add a preservative to it and so on and so forth, or anything that's um, modified atmosphere where you have to take out the oxygen and add in a different gas into the packaging, then we don't cover that. Same with the baby carrots, because it's a slicing and dicing thing, we don't cover that. Um, it gets into a bit of gray area, because sometimes, you know, we think, like, as a certification body, we're like, oh yeah, we cover that, and then Canada the Gap's like, oh no, no, no. So sometimes it's, where the line is, is a little bit gray, and we have to call up Canada the Gap and say, hey, did you consider this um, in your program or not, and can we certify them or not? It's opened up a little bit now with the repacking and wholesaling, because we were limited to just the certain, um, produce that is grown and packed in Canada. Um, but now with the repackaging and wholesalers, we can certify fresh fruits and vegetables that are being distributed, like that could be anything, like bananas and pineapples, where that wasn't covered before. What about microgreens where you clip and Yeah, we do cover microgreens. You cover that? We do. We don't cover sprouts. Right, but we do cover microgreens. And we have a couple certifications under that. So if you take it from the field and don't do anything from it, that will cover them again and again. Yeah. Yeah. And the other kind of the history too is that it was developed by the Canadian Horticultural Council to fill a need for their members. So um, it was driven by the fresh produce industry because there was nothing for them, whereas the, the processing industry already had all these programs in place. And there wasn't a whole lot of nuts grown in Canada, so probably that's why the nuts were included. But if you go down to California, there's like a bazillion different, there's a huge standard for almonds and other kinds of things. There we go. So I think Emily was just talking about how it's a, it's a voluntary program, but it's market driven. So some people argue that it's not voluntary when the retailers are making them do it. So voluntary is a relative term, I guess you could say. Um, in the Canada Gap program does have support for retailers. So Law of Loss is one of the ones that Law of Loss will accept. Uh, Sobeys, Costco, uh, Metro, all of the major brands will accept it. And then um, a lot of the, all the smaller ones as well. When, is there any talk in the future? Like one of my biggest issues with this is there's loopholes, like there's, you know, lots and lots of loopholes. So, you know, somebody is having it and then they're getting in through a back door somehow and... As in like through, through the retailers? Like, so yeah. Like, like, yeah, I know, I understand. I've heard this a lot that it's not fairly um, administered across, you know, they're asking all these group of producers to, to do the program, but then, you know, this store is accepting from anybody in the back door. Or if they really need apples one year, because they're not the buy from anybody if they're short, and they don't care if they have a food safety program. And I can understand that's really frustrating because you, for the people who are their regular suppliers, and all of a sudden they're like, they have to jump through all these hoops to be a regular supplier, and then somebody else comes in at the last minute, and they're like, yeah, we'll take it. Or if it's a lower price, they'll take it. Like it's, I can't really speak to what their, the retailers are doing. I. So what if, I don't know, what if a farm buys from another farm? Like, so, 
Yep. So um, they, are they are they um, gap certified? Is it, like does that mean who they buy from has to be gap certified? They have to make sure that they. Um, right now, the person. So if you're an apple packer and you're buying from a lot of little apple yes. producers, yes. they right now the gap program says you have to have something from them. And right now it could be a letter of assurance saying that we're following basic food safety programs. Um, or they could have a gap certificate, or they could have another food safety certificate. So right now it's not, they all have to be gap certified, unless they're selling to Costco, which is a different story. But, um, and I think Loblaws is also trying to get the little producers who are selling to the packers all certified, but they're, they can't always tell anyone who's no, right? Um, but for Canada Gap, you know, a lot of insurance was in place. This is kind of part of your supplier program that you're doing all this work. You want to make sure that the people who are supplying you with fruit at least follow, you know, know the basics, hand washing, clean water, that kind of thing, and are, are following basic practices. Well, that makes no sense either. Like, really, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. It doesn't help the person who is trying to get Canada Gap certified. Because there's no difference between my farm and my neighbor's farm if we're growing the exact same thing. But he can sell to somebody who is bigger, right? And going to the going to the store, but I can't because I'm medium size. And you're on the on your own. Yeah, yeah, and I understand that. And I just wondered if there's any talk of it becoming instead of voluntary, non-voluntary, as in government regulated. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think so. Just because. The reason I don't think so, maybe Colleen can better speak to this, <laughs> but um, I don't think there's the resources, the government has the resources to enforce it, to follow up, right? And so, I mean, they're covering kind of the higher risk crops, like the meats and stuff, they do meat inspection, but to have fruit, to have inspection on all fruits and vegetable farms across Ontario, I think that's a, it's a huge number, and yeah, I don't have the resources and the to pay for that. Unfortunately, and I understand what you're saying. It doesn't seem fair at all, does it? And I mean, I do see a trend towards rather than this letter of insurance to be going to certify. Certainly, law laws again says we're not. We want to see actually the certificates. They're starting to say we want to see the certificates for all your producers, not just your certificate. And Costco, as part of their Costco audit, they have this whole additional addendum of questions that on top of the Canada Gap, which says all your suppliers have to have a third party. So the trend is definitely moving that way from, from the market standpoint. Um, but right now, I think Canada Gap, again, every year, I, when I was sitting in some of the meetings on the working groups, it was coming up. We should make it mandatory that all the suppliers have to be on it. And there was a lot of pushback saying, well, Canada Gap is a voluntary program. They want to push the uptake of it. Or, anyway, don't fully, I don't want to get it wrong, so I'm not fully understanding exactly what the wild opportunities are. So as you can see, the program was launched in 2008. Right now, there's 2,400 producers across Canada enrolled. Um, there's a bunch of, I told you about the GFSI recognition, and there's a bunch of different certification options you can get enrolled in, which I'll go through in a little bit, so I'm not going to talk about that yet. Um, so what you have in front of you is the Canada Gap Manual of Fruits and Vegetables, plus all the record keeping form templates, plus all the generic appendices at the back, so that's why it's such a giant binder. Um, and as like I said, if you have a greenhouse, you can download the greenhouse manual from um, CanadaGap.ca, but between the greenhouse manual and the fresh fruit vegetable manual, like they're 90% the same. <laughs> And I don't think the audit, you have the copy of the audit checklist, but um, at, on the website, Canada, and if, if you're getting, if your audit's coming up, if you've booked an audit with an auditor, you can go up onto the Canada Gap website and get the actual checklist that the auditors use that they go through when they come up to your farm. And it's a good tool to, to go through just before to make sure that you're ready. There's no, not supposed to be any secrets or surprises. So the manual has the general requirements of what you're supposed to do. The, written out procedures for you exactly step by step how to do it and then they provide the record keeping form templates for you um, and again they're templates they're su 
So you can change the record can be for a tablet. They're designed to be to apply to like producers all across Canada of all different commodities. So for some people, especially the smaller farms, some of the checklists are like, oh my god, this doesn't really apply to me. Um, so taking a little bit of time, and you can get them in Excel or Word as well, so you can kind of chop out some columns that are not applicable to your operation and streamline things a little bit to make it easier. Because you know, people talking to producers, most of them have all the practices in place already. It's just that record keeping part that's the big hurdle to get over for certification. Um, these are this is the just the kind of the outline of what's in the binder, the different sections. There's 24 sections to go through. Covers everything. So again, some people, some of these sections might not even apply. If you don't use ice in your operation, you would just NA the whole section.
if we didn't, we would, you know, put them up, they would stay in the area for a couple days and try and bundle as many as possible and then share those expenses across the group. And we also have, like, so many of them will also give discounts for um, a group of producers. So, you know, if you're under an association or a group or whatever, like 10 or more or 5 or more, we usually can get a, like, a group rate as well. Like you said, you're, I, I have questions about auditors and um, getting help. Like, what do you call that again? Um, Advice and consulting? Yeah, consulting. So, is the consulting like on your own? Like, yes. So, as part of, because we're a certified, certified program and we're an accredited program, as an auditor, we're not allowed to give you advice because it uh, violates our conflict of interest policy. And we're not, as part of this whole um, conflict of interest and impartiality, we're not supposed to be evaluating our own work. So if we told you what to do and then gave you a score against it, that's kind of like not really impartial. So we can tell you, if on an audit, we can tell you, okay, you know, uh, I'm an example, um, you don't have any, uh, you don't have any hand washing signs. Well, that's an easy one to fix. Or um, there is uh, old equipment and things piled up, up against the side of your building. But we can't tell you, okay, well, if you move your pilot equipment three feet to the side, that would be acceptable. We can just tell you, look, there's, a, there's stuff against the wall and that's not, it says here that you can't have that. And we can point you to the part of the standard where it gives you the instructions. So yeah, additional consulting would be a separate kind of, uh, an additional separate service. So, but you can't have the same consultant? Correct. As ever? Uh, so if I say if I come into your farm and did consulting and told you how to get ready and help you with your manual, I'd have to wait two years from our last consulting visit before I could audit you. Oh. So there is a two-year separation. Yeah. So it's just a matter of going to one of the other firms, for instance, to get the consulting and then the audit is by a different company. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes it can be in the same company, just a different division in the same company as well. So uh, I know that SAI Global, they don't have a consulting division. Um, we do, we're trying to make it a separate entity so you can hire some people, we're not supposed to talk to each other and stuff like that, there's all these yeah. rules <laughs> to make it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to enroll, to get started in certification, and I covered this in some of my slides, so then we won't have to cover it later, but you would, you would do everything through Canada Gap to start. So you fill out an enrollment form, you send it into Canada Gap. You need to pay Canada Gap like a, a registration fee or a, like a membership fee, I guess it is, and it's annual. You choose what option you want to be certified on, and you choose who your certification body is. So you would pick right away who it is. Then Canada Gap takes all that information um, and sends it out to the certification body for you. So it's basically one enrollment form directly to Canada Gap. They do all everything at the back end, and then an auditor will be chosen and they'll <coughs> and then they'll set everything up to date and everything. You may get some information, uh, an email, depending on the company. Uh, we have we ask for additional information just so that we can scope it properly and make sure that we're coming out to, uh, at the right time. Just a question, moving back a little bit. For a wholesaler, if you were to pursue like, a new, this new kind of gap certification, uh, what ramifications does that have for your supply chain? Are you then in turn enforcing requirements of the kind of gap? Um, we're asking them to have a supplier approval program. So something in place to make sure that the people that they know who their suppliers are and then there's some basic food safety in place. We're not asking them, the suppliers to all be can and gas specifically certified. But we ask them to have something, again, a letter of insurance, a Canada gas certification, or some other certification perhaps from the country. That the, the whole state would need to decide what they want to do. So if he wanted, he could do a, a, a training like this for all his, his food safety people. Yep. All of them get uh, a training one day, and that, that, that would be enough. They'd all sign the and say, yep. yes, we've been trained. We have yep. programs in And we agree to follow the things. We agree to follow the things. Yeah. Yep. Because again, some of these wholesalers, they're probably bringing in produce from all around the world. Um, they're, Canada Gap is probably not available in certain countries, so they let other programs would be. So 
So the first thing to do before you become begin a role in the program is to make sure you know if you have a customer who's asking for certification, what they want from you. Do they want you to have a JFSI benchmark program, or do they just want to see any kind of certificate, um, or is it just something you're doing on your on your own for your own uh, like marketing or uh, internal reputation? A lot, uh, like Lala's and Costco have specific requirements, only certain options they will accept. So there's all of these certification options. Um, the ones that are benchmarked to GFSI are these two B and C. B is for groups and C is for an individual. And they both are basically an audit every year. If uh, okay. benchmark means it's been recognized by that global food safety initiative. Okay. So sort of that international kind of makes that international recognition. Um, Loblaws is right now saying, okay, any of our, if you're selling us a high risk crop, like lettuce, um, tomatoes, berries, those kinds of things, you have to be certified on a benchmark on option B or C. But if you're selling us a low risk product, like potatoes, um, anything that's uh, cabbage, I think. No, no. Is it leafy? <laughs> Leave it or not. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay, uh, potatoes, uh, turnips, squash, carrots, pumpkins, then you can be uh, on these, one of these, uh, A options, which is a four year cycle. So it becomes, it's cheaper for you because you have a full audit at once every, in the, once in a four year period. So year one, and then years two, three, and four, you just submit a self assessment. So you fill out the checklist yourself, sign the declarations in it. So high risk is something that uh, you would eat red, you would eat uh, raw. Low risk would be something you would further cook, so potatoes, squash, stuff like that. Yeah, lots of lots have their own list as well. Anyway. Yeah. And on the other top, sweet potatoes, we can eat raw. It's generally not the same as yeah. Yes. And generally it's considered a low, it's still considered a low, a low risk product. And you can eat almost anything raw, yeah. but it's like, is it likely also to consider, you know, it hasn't caused any outbreaks? And yeah. Is it likely, how likely is it, how many people are eating it raw? Yeah, and, and like the teacher said, it, some of the different retailers or bodies will have their own list, um, but they're, a lot of it depends on how close it's going to the ground, um, you know, surface area, is it peeled, is it cooked? Um, you know, like apples is a medium, medium to low risk, but I mean, it's eaten raw, Plus you have to do 
do internal audits of all your group members every year. Um, Last one? Yep. Um, there's an annual program fee again that's paid to Canada Gap, and it depends on what option you're on. So when I say A1 and A2 are much more, much less expensive. There's an A. You don't only have to pay for that full audit once every so every so many years. In A2, you also are subject to a random audit. If you get chosen, you get into the pool of random audits for so many chosen every year by Canada Gap. You don't pay the audit fees or the expenses for the random audits. Canada Gap pays for that. So your program fees will pay for that. You only pay for your full scheduled audit once every five years. Is a random audit move the scheduled audit if it's represented? Oh, if you're an A2, it is. And that's the difference between the option A1 and A2. A2, if you get a random audit, that pushes your next scheduled audit to be another four years down. But in A1, it's the fixed cycle. So year one and year five, you have a scheduled audit no matter what happens in between. Uh, program benefits. Should I be anything specifically jumping out? Are you any questions? Um, market access tools to help. It's kind of a systematic tool for you for improvement. Next. Good way to spend your extra time. That's okay. <laughs> and this is the Canada Gap contact information. So again, canagap.ca. Go to for information. Sometimes people do call our office and say, hey, I want to enroll, and we'll help we'll help walk people through the process as well. Question about the group. Is the group self-defined? Um, there are some basic requirements for a group, what makes a group, but you have to have a group management system. So basically a system to make to determine who gets to be in the group and who doesn't. You have to internally audit your group members. So you have to have a person who's an internal auditor and review those audits and some fails. You have to have you know, procedures in place for that kind of stuff. So I think that's the key. If you have a formal group management system, you can have anybody can be a group. So why is the benefit of being a group? For larger groups, it can be a little bit less expensive. I think there's like a, a point if you have if you if you're if for some groups, especially if they're already having a lot of them are already internally managing stuff. So then you don't have to have each group member. You don't have to pay the full audit fees for every group member every year. So for the smaller group members, it's it's less expensive. For the management system, for the kind of the big group, they have to maybe pay somebody, you know, have a staff person who, to do the internal audits, but that's probably, again, less expensive than paying a third-party auditor to come out every year to, to, to audit every single group member. Like, an example of that would be the Bradford Marsh. A lot, a, like one place in there does it for all the little care farmers that would have around there. Yeah, and we have um, a tree for people at BC where, again, all in just a bazillion little tiny orchards, little producers, and they're all part of this big group. So the big packing house, they have a full-time staff person who runs the program, who does internal audits of all the little people, and then we might sample audit uh, six per year out of 40. Because I wanted to join a group, but we don't qualify to join a group. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. That was it? Yeah, that was the end of that. Okay, so um, let's just have a look at this giant binder. Okay. Unless there's any more questions. Try not to fall off. I wonder if there's one I could get that I could just wave around. Huge. But um, the key part, there's several different things in this binder. And not all is stuff you will use all the time. So the first part is. To the first yellow, so there's, like, there's some yellow separators, but from the front to the first yellow separator, that is the actual manual. Okay, so this part's the actual food safety manual. It has all the procedures for you, it's sections 1 to 24, and it all has also the introduction and how to fill the manual instructions and so on and so forth. So that's sort of the key thing. This is it starts with section one, commodity starter products. And this is the part that you would you would review. You fill out once, you review it every year, and then you're basically 
finished. <laughs> with it. You can, you, so it, it tends to how to do it, what to do in the section. It's all of your procedures. So basically, you would review sections 1 to 24. You check each one of these procedures anywhere there's a square, a square bullet. And I'm on page one of the, the actual number one. So you have to print that for off every year? Well, no, actually. You, you only have to print it off once. They're working on like an online system where you can do everything on the computer if you want to, for people who like to or are very tech savvy. You print it off once, and then if you look at the end of section one, which is just before this premises tab, there's this oof, confirmation <laughs> update log. I think I've been doing my work out. Um, here, this little chart at the bottom. So the first year you, you filled everything out, you feel like you're in compliance, you ticked off all the boxes, you would sign in, initial date that first column, say for 2014, I'm good. Next year, you would review everything again, if there's any changes, you'd make note of the changes, you know, cross out parts that maybe you're not doing anymore, or add-ins and stuff, or you might have to print off a couple new pages if there's an update, and then you would just check next year's box. So the idea is that every year you don't print off the whole thing, you just take the... That's what I don't understand, because if you're going to check these things off, how can you check them off every year? Like, well, you only have to check them off once. So if your procedure changes, if your procedures, these are the procedures that shouldn't change that much over time. So it's basically, you know, are you um, following the label instructions for your pesticide applications? Well, yes, I follow the label instructions. I can check those off, and next year I'm still going to be following that procedure. So you're just going to review it, make sure you're still doing it, and then that extra signature for that year at that bottom is that you're saying, yeah, I'm still doing the exact same things as I ticked off. If there's one box that changes, you can just write a note. If you feel like this whole section is not applicable, you can cross it out, or you need to, you, it was not applicable last year, you cross it out. You could print off just that one section or one page if there was a lot of changes. But generally speaking, you won't have to print off the whole binder again. <coughs> would it be acceptable? Because when I went through it, and then, like, to break little notes down. Yeah, yeah. like that's absolutely a Yeah. The other thing is, is that a question? Well, this is, this is standards against which this is set. Yeah. And you mentioned about the example of the three feet of the equipment, three feet of Now, would we know going through this that we can't have our equipment? Yeah. So it's all in here. It'll say uh, equipment is, uh, the producer keeps equipment three feet from the wall. Uh, that might not be exactly what it says, but it gives you the distance and everything in here. So the yeah, exact requirements will be in here, and you'll read it, and you'll say, yep, I do that, or I need to do that, I need to fix that, and then you check it off once it's done. Um, oh, I have a question. So you do this once a year, like, like can we pick the time when we're going to go? The best time is actually during your quiet season, because you're reflecting upon, you have some time to actually think about what you're planning to do for the season, you're not so busy with production that, you know, you don't have time to think about it, or, 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 and then you're once you think about it ahead of time, you can start fresh from doing things right from the start. And does it all have to be done within the same amount of time? No. A lot of people will. I see, and again, when I do audits, I see people that have sections. This section filled out and signed in January, and then the next section was in February, and the next section was in March, and so on. So, on. so it's kind of like as you're working through it, you would if you if you feel like you're fully compliant with this section, but there's other sections you still need to work on, you sign off the one section, but wait for the other ones. And actually, that was a, a farmer made that point to me. He tries to do a little bit every month, rather than trying to tackle the whole book at once. He said, I might try, because there is a lot of things to go over, I try and go over a little bit every month, so this way I'm always doing something to make sure I'm, I'm on track and he has a schedule of uh, how he does it all year round, so it just follows the cover. Well, because there are things you have to do Monthly. Yeah. 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 So this manual part, this is section 1 to 24, is kind of like once a year in the off season, just be before you start, kind of to get yourself organized. And then, like I said, there's the ongoing records that you would keep on an ongoing basis. And so then that is the next yellow section. Like you go between the next two yellow dividers. The one where the tabs are, right? there's one that has the introduction and then the next one. And that's all the record keeping forms.
And if you can go to the one there's a tab that says A, Building, Sketch, and Agriculture Chemical Storage Checklist. And so I can see really put together a nice binder for you. I got it on uh, because it does tell you the, the name of the form. It gives you the name and the letter, which is referenced throughout the manual. So for you to find something, it's like super easy. Um, so say if you look at this, is the sketch. It tells you, okay, this is form A, and in the section, of, like the front and the premises section, it references form A, so you can kind of cross reference. It also tells you how often you have to do this. So here in the top corner, it says this is an annual form. You update it once a year. And I think all the first few up until E and up until so up E and F are all annual forms. I guess I I thought I'm confused because it says completed by date, and then I think well that date does that just mean the very first time you did it like two years ago or something? Um, on B or just oh. Yeah, this is like before, well, the type of storage assessment is before you start you, before you start using your cooler or your storage room that you've gone through to make sure that this is, all these things are in place. You can use this one form over and over again, but I would personally, since it's just one page, yeah. just print a new one every year and print it out and then refill it out yeah. in this specific case. It makes, just makes more sense. It's cleaner. But then C and D, they're your they're hygiene policies already written out for you. Those are things, again, that might not change very much unless you start using gloves or you stop using gloves or something like that. So then you could just fill out this one and then you wouldn't have to have a new one. You could just fill them again, that confirmation update log on the bottom. So this is your policy, this, this is your policy. Once you check it all off, this becomes your policy. Yeah. Now, is there a, like, if you don't, is there a standard that you have to use, like when it says here, if gloves and aprons are not used, like is there a, a thing where it says you have to use gloves? No. Uh, this program does not require the use of gloves. I believe in section, um, like would you lose points on the audit if you were not using them? No. The, when you would lose points on an audit, uh, or if they were using gloves but they were not using them properly. Or, you know, if they were washed, they were not using gloves and they were washing their hands. So the key is that um, proper hand washing needs to be done. And proper glove, if they're using gloves, they have to still have proper hand washing and proper glove use. So when I'm up, on, up doing an audit, if I see some people use gloves and some people don't, I can ask them questions. How often do you change your gloves or not, or how often do you wash your hands? And if I see them working with something that's like all ripped up and torn and they're not changing it or something like that, they're like patting the dog with their gloves and they're going back to what they're doing without replacing it, taking the gloves in the washroom with them, and then you lose marks. That's not a problem. But just the fact that they have gloves or not is not enough. Because sometimes when you're, if you're harvesting a product, if you're harvesting it in August, right. it's warm, but if you're harvesting it in November, they're using gloves for warmth. Is that right. the same kind of a glove? Like, you know what so it's, it's different, and the requirements of gloves are different for if you're outside of the orchard versus inside the packing house. It's much more strict in a packing house, but in an orchard, the, there's much there's different requirements. So you can use cloth gloves out of an orchard, or, le or leather gloves, like, or out of the field, or for potato harvesting, or something like that, where it's, people are not using them to keep their, you know, for protection. They're using them to keep their hands warm or to protect their hands. And where's like, is that in here? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it would be in section two places. Uh, da, 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 personal hygiene. No. What's section eleven? Gloves. Hand washing. Hand washing. Can't you know this off like that? No. We'll we'll probably get to that when we get yes. to hand washing. Yes. Okay. We'll we will. Well, Paulie's going to go through all that stuff. Through the next few days. On the hygiene, but it, it's in the manual. It's also in the form as well. So basically, this manual spells out, like, like in minute detail in some cases, exactly what to do and how to do it. So how, like, if an auditor sees that, like, what if you're not doing 80% of what's in here because you just, that's not your procedure? Yep, so 
you, you would have you would mark that, right? So certain things, if it's not applicable to you, you should be you know making that clear in your paperwork. It's not applicable, or we don't do this. Or whatever. also, if there's something here that you can't do for whatever reason, I don't know. I'm try, um, trying to think, or it's just not working for you. For the, you can come up with an alternate procedure that would meet the same need. So okay, an example was. If you 
the next, so I've talked about the sort of the basic part of the manual, sections 1 and 24, is that first part. Then you look at the form, which is the next part behind the next yellow tab, and then go again to that first, or if there's an orange divider that says appendices. So the appendices is basically a whole bunch of reference material. It's not mandatory procedures, it's not really, there's no forms in there that you have to do, it's just extra resources for you. So some people, things to address common questions that were, um, that producers had when they were trying to implement this, like how do I do a mock recall? Or how do I um, take a water test properly? Or um, how do I write an S, a, pro a good sanitation standard operation? So it's just reference materials that you may or may not refer to. Um, it's like there's some really good information in there, but it's not it's sort of like extra stuff. But again, it's all part of this whole package of things with like a lot, a lot of information. And which it is, but some again, a lot of it may not apply. So as we go through, I mean, as we go through the rest of the workshop, Colleen's going to be picking out specific parts of the requirements, and then we'll be kind of referencing back to the specific part of the manual, so you can kind of get a better idea what detail is in there, and then you can kind of start to fill it out too, and so that you kind of get a head start. Yeah. Any questions? Um, I know. Sorry, I might have given you a little when you were when you first started talking about Peter, but um, just um, you know what the exclamation marks are? Um, yes, that's good. So, I'll you describe that. Okay, so, so first, um, I'm going to point out a couple things at the very beginning of this whole binder. Kind of the setup. If you forget everything I talk about today, when you go home, because there's going to be a lot of information in the next two days. Um, Everything basically I just explained is written in here for you. So under introduction, these are like the beginning of like the Roman numeral pages. Once you get past the uh, index or the table of contents, there's the introduction, the scope, the purpose, and then this how do I use this manual section, which is page B, Roman numeral five, kind of goes through everything, you know, how to pick up the boxes, everything that's here. There's also this little music we wrote now for horticulture which kind of talks about some of the stuff we talked about earlier and the scope and everything that we went through earlier this morning. Um, and then if you go to page DII, it talks, there's an important note about these exclamation marks. So throughout this manual, in these sections, there are little exclamation marks marked. <laughs> Um, and they identify basically a procedure where there's a record associated with it. So it kind of helps you, if you see the exclamation mark, you know that somewhere down the line it's going to tell you you're going to have to keep some sort of record. And again, it might be referring to one of those annual records, or it might be an ongoing record. So an ongoing record would be your, you know, your bathroom checklist, or your training log, or your visitor log. So as you go along, you see the exclamation marks. It's more, it's again, sort of a tool to help you. It's not a huge, you know, it just if you forget and wondering why those are there, that's why they're there. It's identifying the record. And I'll speak over um, the must-haves versus should-haves. Yes. And talk a little bit about that from an auditor standpoint. Yep. Almost almost everything in here is a must-do or a must-have. There's a couple areas where it says this is highly recommended. So one of those would highly recommend it would be irrigation water testing. You don't have to test your irrigation water unless you're in a greenhouse. But for, for field crops, you don't have it's highly recommended. So as an auditor, we're auditing you against the must-dos. If you everything else and anything with a square checkbox is a must-do procedure. So if you it's a must-do, then we're auditing you to those standards. And again, if you unless you really really can't you come up with a deviation procedure, we still have to meet the intent of that somehow. Water testing for field use would almost be impossible for a whole lot of things. There's people watering out of a pond that could be tested. They have to out of, out of a creek, yeah. kind of hard to do. Out of Lake Erie, kind of hard to do. Yeah, well, that's why it's not mandatory. I mean, you can, you would, it is recommended, and there's good, there's, 
There's um, an underwater talking about agricultural water at some point. We'll be talking about it with Colleen later on, but OMAP has very good recommendations on how to collect water tests. You basically, I mean, I've had my raincoat on and been standing under your these nozzles, which are like basically shooting water at, you know, so hard it's going to knock the bottle out of my hand. I'm trying to get the bottle out of the nozzle of the irrigation system rather than going to the lake because the lake's not really representative. Again, that's why it's not a mandatory practice, it's a highly recommended practice because what the information we're getting from there, it's difficult to get, but it's not hugely reliable in telling us exactly what's going on. But it's good information to have so that you have knowledge. Anyway, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Any other questions right here? 